To me, business has always been about how people communicate and how people learn. You can create any product you want to, but if you don't communicate it properly and you don't teach people about that product properly, it's never gonna make it to market. Hello and welcome to Care to Lead. Herman DeBoard is CEO and founder and creator of Disruptive Next Gen Hover Technology is with us today. He has spent his career at the apex of creative content creation, business development, and technology. We are really excited to have you here today. And would you like to tell us a little bit about Hover and what its place is in the world today? Yeah, sure. You know, we started Hover back in late 2019. It was basically at the time, it was a gig economy company. We wanted to create something that was similar to Uber, but instead of connecting riders to drivers, we were connecting virtual travelers to human walkers in other countries and other cities. So we got that thing up and running in about 15 countries and tested it kind of during the pandemic and and then a little post-pandemic as well. And then since then, we've been growing rapidly. We've been moving into a productive state where we have a product that can be licensed by organizations. We're growing into the Las Vegas and Nashville areas pretty good here. And then we've recently just acquired a a fiber optics company that will combine into our video product to make a kind of like a mobile security system that people are pretty excited about. So yeah, Hover's been doing great. I'm, I'm having a great time with it. So for our listeners who aren't familiar with exactly what that means, you're connecting a virtual platform with a someone, a live walker. Can you tell us more? Yeah, sure. As a matter of fact, we were just at the Super Bowl in in Las Vegas. We did about seven events at the Super Bowl. And so basically we have we have walkers on the ground. So instead of drivers like you see that it's hired by rideshare companies, we hire walkers. So it's people with mobile devices. We're getting ready to move into the area of I would call it drones and GoPros and things like that. For now it's mobile devices. And so we hire people on the ground. They sign up as a walker. They use their mobile device to it's it's almost like you're a, you're a tour guide. So the reason that we launched this is because right now, if you go on the internet, it's all creator centered. It's all curated content that you see on the internet. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to put that control in the hands of the traveler. So it, for example, I want to see what's going on in Rome right now, and I want to see it live. So you can log onto the app without knowing anybody. You can select Rome, you can select a person on the map, and essentially you go live. And so they they will show you whatever you want to see and you can talk to them, you can communicate, and then you get to save your videos as you're exploring the world in real time. So that is really awesome. And what's going through my head is when I'm looking at real estate in another state and like, I don't trust the realtor. I don't trust the pictures online because it's like a dating app. You never know what you're getting. So he could like a real person. All right, walk into that, open that closet. Let me see. That could be really cool. Yeah. And actually, it's not just uh, real estate in another state. One of the first countries that came to us for real estate was Malta because they're they're a small country off the coast of Italy, but it's very difficult to get there. It's very expensive and difficult to get there to actually see their real estate and to see what they have for sale. And so we're we're getting ready to start a a real estate program with them that that actually shows what they have for sale. It's a very historic area. And and it's actually not that expensive to to purchase, you would think, to purchase real estate in, in Malta. But we're, we're also working with a couple groups, for example, in Las Vegas, we're going to start by showing million dollar homes and up just to, to limit foot traffic. But, you know, our system can come on and we can have, you can have an open house with up to 15,000 people looking at, at real estate. And that's just one angle. Like that's, that's interesting that you went there because a lot of people do when they hear about this platform, they're thinking, Ooh, I can go look at land and homes and different things like that. Well, I, I think it's really interesting. I use, I always use that Google Earth thing. Like when my husband goes, let's take this road trip. And we were in Maui once and he took me on this like cliff and it was terrifying. So now every time he says, well, I want to take a road trip, but like, I, I have to see the road. Like, oh, yeah. I, and, I, and like I follow it the whole way. So I can see so many uses for what you're doing. I think that's really awesome. And that brings me to my next question for you is you've got this awesome platform. What's the company like behind the platform? How many people do you have and where are you based and how does all that work? This is my fourth company. So I, I built and sold three companies prior to this. And so 
I'm a fan of connecting in with third parties who who have services to offer. We have about in total, we're at about 80 total employees, and that doesn't include like the gig economy workers and some of the others. Gig economy workers, we're in we're in the hundreds, maybe a little over a thousand right now. We're we're growing. We're growing pretty rapidly. But the our our platform, we have about we're in Denver, so we have about six employees in Denver. We have a few in Houston, and we have we have a lot of our developers are in the Philippines. We have two in Canada. We like to create a 24-hour development cycle. So, you know, while people are sleeping in the United States, they're developing in the Philippines. While they're sleeping in the Philippines, we're developing here. And so we're in a constant development mode. I mean, we've got apps on Apple and Google, and then we have a web app too. So you have to stay consistent. We had, it was pretty interesting. We had about 22 people on the ground in Las Vegas for our events. And while they were on the ground, you know, all of the developers would, they, even in the Philippines, they would be awake, you know, trying to make sure everything was going smoothly and everything was running the way it should have run. It was fun. It was a really fun time. It was exciting. You get a little bit of stress when that, that sort of thing happens. But yeah, I'm all, I'm all about like my social media company is in San Francisco. My, I have another agency that's in Florida. They do different ty- types of marketing for us, different types of just promotion. And then when you add up our developers and and all of the marketing and all of the sales and everything that we've got to do and everything we've got going, it's a pretty big organization, but most of it is we're a very small company and we we farm out to third parties. Okay. So you said this is your fourth company. Is that correct? So how long ago was it from your first company until now? I launched my very first company in 2005. I ended up selling that one. That one took a little longer to get off the ground, I had a couple uh, evolutions. It was my first run at it, but I I launched a, a greeting card company and sold it. And then I launched a music distribution company and technology and sold it. That's kind of the path that I've been on is I build companies, get them up and running. And then we usually try to, we usually try to file a, an S1 statement to go public, but I've never made it to, to the public market because we always get uh, acquired prior to that. And I think this one's not going to be any different, especially since we just acquired this fiber optics company. I think we're getting a lot more attention than than just being a video company. So I guess my question for you is the leadership, the type, the, a lot has happened since 2005, right? Globally, politically, globally, pandemic-wise, and AI, so much has changed from 2005 to 2024. What are the leadership skills that were not necessary then that you think are necessary now to run a successful company? Wow, uh, that's a great question. Um, You know, I think for me, it's been um, to adopt a a more global culture in in my own office. So I I run, I, I usually work out of my home. And I think this global culture is where we're hiring people. We have walkers, we have gig economy workers in in about 15 countries. So when you look at our geopolitical climate is very different than what's in Australia and what's in London and what's in Rome and what's in Portugal and what's in Brazil. And so everybody that comes to us has a a different, kind of a different mindset. And so we we try to keep politics out of it, but believe it or not, a lot of people want to use our app because they don't necessarily trust the media these days. So so and I guess that's not a secret. But when they when they see something like that's pu- published on the news, like this is going on in Brazil right now, instead of like believing it, now they're trying to like get onto our app to go and see for themselves because our app is live in real time. And so we try to teach. What I try to do is em- em- envelop a, a almost a a belief system that the world is is an open book, and so that's what we want to do. We want to bring the world to everybody. So from a leadership standpoint, you have to. You have to kind of adopt everybody's beliefs and everybody's cultures without, it's very, um, it can be a very, uh, the climate can make it a kind of uh, interesting when you, when you have so many different political views and so many different, even cultural views and, and, and anything about gender and anything about equality and anything about everything that's going on in the world. What we're trying to do is just be that flashlight. We're trying to be that that light to say, this is what's really going on. You can make your own opinion. You can have your own, your own interests. You can have anything you want to have. You know, we, we don't care what you believe, but we don't want to bring those necessarily into 
our business. We just want to be that light that shines on the, onto the world so that you can have a better understanding of what's really going on out there. No one ever, is, no employee ever is going to take your business as seriously as you do. As an entrepreneur, we all know that. So what do you do to keep them motivated, keep them engaged, keep them doing 100% so that they're there when you need them? Yeah, so you will you could interview any of my employees and they'll tell you the same thing about me. From day one, from the very first business I started, I always adopt that philosophy as, as the tide ro- rises, all boats rise. I have that posted in my office. I mean, that's absolutely my philosophy. So I always give employees opportunity for ownership. I always give them opportunity that, you know, they think, well, if this thing sells, if this thing gets acquired, then I'm out, I'm, I've lost. And so I want to give them opportunity to, to earn ownership, to earn stock options, to earn those things so that they see that upside too. And then they're more invested into the company. Now we can do that because we're a small company. And I try to always maintain that, that small culture, that small nature of, of, of a startup, even though we're four or five, going on five years old, um, that if you maintain that small culture and that small philosophy and you give them opportunities for ownership, they kind of buy in more. And so they're more excited every day to get up like, wow, I have, I have 50,000 stock options. If this, thing, if this thing sells, I'm gonna make a lot of money. So I wanna do my best for this company. And so that's always been my philosophy and it, it's always seemed to work for me. That, it's funny that you say that very, very early in my career, I was in a company that offered stock options and I was just so young and so stupid. And I did not, I'm like, what's this? This is nothing. This is no value to me at all. And like everyone who stayed there, like got really rich and stupid me. I'm like, boy, was that a <laughs> learning <laughs> 2020 hindsight, right? It's a learning curve. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you can always, if you can grab a piece of that company, if you believe in the company, now mm-hmm. if you don't believe in the company, obviously you're not gonna, that doesn't matter. It's kind of like you said, like, this is just a piece of paper. This doesn't matter. But if you believe this company is going to run and you believe in the leadership and you believe it's going to sell, having a piece of that and having that ownership really changes your attitude towards working for the company. Well, I think young people today are far smarter than I was when I was that age. And I'm, I'm in that boat with you. I am. So here, here's my next question. As you look at your organization and and of course, you're here and, and you're going to shine the best light as you can. But to get real on leadership, what, what do you struggle with? What do you find are, as challenges in your day-to-day running a business that you wish weren't there? You know, it's probably how, honestly, it's probably how politics seeps into the everyday life of business. Like for me, I wish, I wish politics didn't seep into business. I wish we could just run a business with a product and a service. For example, we partner with colleges around the country. So like we have a big partnership with UNLV and, and we'll be there next week actually at a, one of their career events. And we, we try to hire students to, to work for us in the Las Vegas area. And then we're doing that the same thing around the country with other universities. And we're starting to do that around the world with other universities. But it's very, very difficult. It's almost like you have to, you're not necessarily walking on eggshells, but you have to be very, very soft when you come in as far as understanding what someone believes and you know everything from their political beliefs to the, to the pronoun phenomenon that's going on to everything that's that's happening in the world you have to be very very delicate as you move forward in in your hiring people and you have to train your top level people to also be that way because if they're you know gen x or above like i am we didn't grow up that way we grew up very you know, latchkey kids, very, you know, taking care of ourselves, uh, a little more hard, hardened by the world. And so that part is very difficult. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort where if, if I had my preference, we would just be saying, hey, this is our service. We have this great video service. You can make a lot of money doing this. This is what we want you to show. But you have to in today's climate, you can't do that. You have to kind of understand the people that are coming in just a little bit more before you go. But it's very time consuming. It really is. It sounds to me like what you're saying is empathy is very important in leadership today, maybe more so than it has been in the past. And I couldn't agree with you more. I like to think about empathy. Empathy is just such a buzzword, right? Have empathy, have empathy, be an empathetic leader. But the reality is what you're saying is you have to look at that person in front of you and genuinely try to understand and have compassion for that person. And one of the the tips that I always tell leaders is just be curious. 
-hmm. Don't be judgmental. Just be curious. Ask them more questions because the way that that's going to change where you feel like you have to walk on eggshells or be super careful about what you say is to honestly have a conversation with someone by following your curiosity without judgment. And that opens the door for empathy and helps leaders navigate that so much more easily. It does, you know, and that's a great point. One of the one of the things we do with our leadership teams, my master's degree and PhD is in communication studies. So one of the things we we go through is a is a process of listening. And so listening is you're asking a question, but you have to step back and really listen to what that person is saying. And if you want to get the most out of that employee and you want to really bring them into to your culture you need to understand what they're trying to say and you need to understand where they're coming from. And it's really, to me, it's a, it's a exercise in communications. It's interpersonal communications. Even though you, you want to focus on the business to me, business has always been about how people communicate and how people learn. You can create any product you want to, but if you don't communicate it properly and you don't teach people about that product properly, it's never going to make it to market. And, and that also boils down to the people that you're bringing in. So like you said, if you have empathy for those people and you have good listening skills, they're going to want to to take your product and also educate other people about it. And, it's, and, and how do they communicate to the world and how are they coming off? And so for me, communication is just, it's been the key to every business I've ever created. Even though I'm in technology, it's communication. Absolutely. And I I love that. And I like that you work on listening skills with your teams. One of the exercises we do when I work with executive teams is we do a listening exercise because we can all talk about listening, listen deeply, like really hear what they're saying and yada, 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 right? Really listening is hard. So one of the exercises that I do with executives is they'll have a conversation. We'll break them up into pairs and they'll have a conversation and they are not allowed to respond. They're just allowed to listen like for three minutes. And it is so hard, but it 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 makes them really understand how often they're trying to respond, how often they're thinking the next thing they want to say. And you can't that's not listening. Another thing is we have them do it again. Only this time they're allowed to respond only by asking questions and that their mind goes to, they start thinking, all right, what's the next question I want to ask? What's the next question I want to ask? The gift, the talent lies in learning to just follow your curiosity. Because when you're genuinely listening, you're going to get curious. You just are. It's when you're not listening, when you're focused on yourself, like, what am I going to ask next? Where does this conversation go? How can I get in what we sell? Like all of those things that totally ruins the nuance of following your curiosity. That is you, that is so true. I, I think what I always try to tell people is we live in this in this world or we were taught in business that we have to be solutions based to everything that we hear. So as soon as something comes in, especially as men, we, as soon as something comes in, we want to have a solution. That's what we want to do. But but what we do that's a little different than what you just said, which is great. I mean, I, I might take some of those and, and add them in, is we always do a reflection. So where you you're listening, so you're listening to something, and then all you have to do is reflect what they just said back to them. You're not coming up with a solution. All you're saying is what I heard you say is, and then that's it. So that you can come up with that understanding. That's really what you're trying to do is is develop a bigger, just a, a bigger feeling of understanding between the two. Like, what are you trying to say? And so, mo- a lot of times they get it wrong. It's like, this is what I heard you say. And that's not what the message was at all. So they have to go back and change their words sometimes. And when they go back and change their words, now they get that understanding of what they're pitching. And that actually helps in sales. It helps in marketing. It helps in just internal culture. It's it's a fantastic exercise. It really is. It is. We even do in meetings. Like we when if you go into a meeting and say you have a problem, right? Your 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 company has this area that they want to break into and they don't have any walkers or riders or whatever you have, your live virtual people, you don't have them and you're trying to solve this problem. So you go into this meeting and often people just start spitting out their thoughts and their ideas and brainstorming. And and that's good. But if you take five minutes at the beginning of the meeting and say, here's the problem, I'm going to isolate this for you. Take five minutes and write down your thoughts. That is like this transformational five minutes because now 
they've it's gone from their their head right to the paper without any emotion or opinions coming in. And you're also not hearing them say, well, yeah, I agree with what she said or, or just like basing their thoughts on everyone else. It creates such expansive thinking that you can solve so many more problems. And you're right. It starts with that reflection, that first five minutes of just write it down. It's a game changer. It is. It really is. I will never stop building companies based on communication and education. I think those two things you can you can solve. Like even when I sold my first company, I went into consulting a little bit. And that was nine times out of 10, that was the problem they were having. They couldn't get their product to market because they weren't communicating it effectively. They weren't educating the comp- the, the public effectively. They had marketing, they had good images, they had everything that they needed to have, but the message just wasn't getting out there. And then when you really start to deep dive into their their company and their culture, it's because they're not communicating internally very well. And it goes right back to what you were just saying. These little exercises can just make a huge difference in a company's culture. I find it interesting, too. Your companies, you know, with internal employees a little smaller, that you're probably able to be more hands-on and really know what's going on in each level. But sometimes CEOs of, of the very large companies, on their level, things are going great. And they're just not aware of, of these little nuances that are happening, you know, five levels down or five locations away. Yeah. So I, I had that experience. I said I had 13 years in the government. I spent, I was a Gulf War veteran and then I got out and I, when I was finishing my bachelor's, master's and PhD, I continued to work in the government. And that's a great example of a huge bureaucracy where the top level has no idea what's going on seven levels down. And, and there's literally that many levels or more in some of these government agencies. And so when you go down and talk to the people who are just been hired, they have problems that that don't make its don't make its way up to the top sometimes. And and at the top you think hey everything's going great, we made our budgets, we did everything right, we're getting our bonuses, but down here you've got or maybe in the middle somewhere, you've got some unhappiness going on and it's because that that process of communication up and down is not it's broken somewhere. So when you start to look at the organizational communication side of that, you're right. It it can get messy in a large bureaucracy. So what advice do you have for a, an individual who's thinking about starting their own company, their own startup, they, they want to go for it, they're excited? What's the leadership advice you could give to them? Wow. I would say starting out and, and, and getting started, perfection is your enemy. You want, that to, you want everything to be perfect when you first get it out there, or at least I did. You have to be okay with, with having what I call an ugly MVP. You have to be okay with getting something basic down, getting that product out, making sure there's adoption of that product in the marketplace. And you have to be okay with, with what can be negative feedback sometimes, which as founders, sometimes we think we have the best ideas and we know what, what's right for the world. But when you start to get that feedback, it can crush you sometimes. Don't let it. Just get that ugly MVP out there, whatever your product is, get some feedback from actual consumers. And, you know, I think one of the problems I've always seen with that is you can't take, if you have 10 consumers and they all give you their feedback, they're not all going to be right. So you have to get a wider angle of it. You can't just say, well, I'll change that. I'll change that. You can't change everything everybody says. You have to get a a wider angle and and go to 200 people and see where's the average feedback coming back that I need to make some changes on this product. And you have to be okay with that, like adjusting your product until you get it to a retail-ready state. That's usually the biggest problem I see is they'll, they'll go raise money and they think they have the, the perfect product and they put all their money into this product and then they're broke and they have no way to market the product to get the feedback and they have to go raise more money and they can't because they haven't had adoption. So it's, you know, you got to put your ego aside as a founder. You've got to be okay with feedback and ugly MVPs. That would be my, my biggest starting point for founders. That's great, great advice. And it reminds me of a book that I came across very recently. I don't know the author. I'm not. But this is a plug for a book because it is phenomenal for exactly what you're talking about. It's called The Mom Test. And I don't remember the name of the writer, but have you heard of it? I have heard of it. Yes. Yeah. It's a great, great book. And I've been recommending it to clients all the time because and I wish I had had it like three or four revisions ago, you know, before, because you, that feedback is really important. So that's a good, good piece of advice. And what else do you want people to know right now about Hover? 
I, I think what I would like them to know is is Hover is in a in a pretty good growth stage right now. We've stabilized our our apps, and we are we are getting ready to make some big changes. That's going to really overtake some of this creator centric social media. So just be on the lookout. If you you know we're we're hitting groups like disabled veteran groups, retired community groups. We're hitting college students. Anyone with a mobile device who just wants to have this extra gig economy, this extra side gig on that, that they, they need to make money. We're currently, they can currently make $42 an hour just giving tours of their local area that, I mean, it's, it's very, very simple to do that. And then we're going to change it so you can make drastically more than that. So that change will be coming later this year. And we're working on that right now as we're trying to get these through these changes through Apple and Google's platform. But yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting platform. You don't need a car. You just need a mobile device. And you can you can actually do some good things, talk to some people, make some good money. So yeah, just be on the lookout for Hover Everywhere. That actually sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds like an amazing platform. And like, I have a son who wanted to drive for, he lives in Baltimore. He wanted to drive for Uber. And I'm like, can't drive for Uber in Baltimore. You know, it's not safe. Are you safe? And I don't think Uber's safe anyway, half the time. So I was like, not that he listens to me anyway, but I was like, no, it's a bad idea. But this, like, it's safe. Like, you're on, you're you're in control. You don't have strangers getting into your car with your mother worried. Yeah, that's right. And you can actually end the walk if you feel like you're in danger. Like, we've gone through several iterations of why a walker should end a walk or why a traveler should end a walk if they're being shown something inappropriate. Or, you know, we've had to go through so many iterations of this so far that it's, it's a pretty good app. So I think you're right. It's, and it's only going to grow in use cases, like what people are using it for. It's going to get better and better. I know my head's already going around like the, I, it sounds so fun what you're doing. I, it's exciting and it's fun. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to get to join in and join your journey just a little bit here today. Awesome. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So I want to thank you. And is there and where would you like our listeners? And first of all, who would you like to reach out if I say reach out on LinkedIn or reach out on their website? Do you want people who want to be gig workers for you? Or do you want people who are investors? Who are you looking to connect with right now today? Yeah, you know, we've raised almost $4 million we've raised for this company. I mean, it's been pretty easy to raise money once people understand what we're doing. So we're still, we have a current open round. So if investors want to contact us, great. Gig economy workers can go to hover.com, H-U-V-R.com. And, and Hover is an acronym. It stands for Human Virtual Reality. That's what H-U-V-R stands for. And we like to use it as a verb. So you can hover into Las Vegas, hover into Rome. And so uh, it's very memorable when people start to k- grasp what it is. But you can download the app on Apple or Google. You can sign up as a traveler. You can sign up as a walker. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on right now. So uh, I would suggest just starting with the website or LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Yeah, LinkedIn is always a great place to connect with professionals. But thank you so much for your time. And to our listeners, thank you so much for being here today. And we will see you on the next episode of Care to Lead.